Yeah. OK. Let's get started. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. OK, great. So um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name's Barry Dorr. I'm a lecturer in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at SDSU. I also uh, play a little music. It's so exciting to see my students from the ECE program, the students from the music program, um, lots of music friends on Zoom. Uh, it's really exciting to have you all here. If you're an ECE student and you're taking Part A Senior Design next semester, stick around because I want to talk about projects, uh, musically oriented projects. Ah, here we go. OK, so in this lecture, we're going to kind of stand on the bridge between music and engineering. We've got music, we've got engineering, and we're going to look at the view uh, from that bridge. This stuff can get pretty complicated pretty quickly, so we're going to keep the music simple, and we're going to keep the math simple. And you're not going to become a better engineer because you came to this presentation, and you're not going to become a better musician either by coming to this presentation. But you're going to learn some stuff that I just find fascinating. And the one thing I can promise you is you'll be a lot more interesting at holiday parties, especially if there's uh, music going on. So logistically, this lecture is going to go about an hour and 10 minutes. I did everything I can to shorten it. That's the hardest part uh, of giving this lecture. So let's see. Here we go. OK, so we'll start off by just talking about sound. And a tone is just not really a very musical thing. Let's listen to it. OK, so not a lot of music going on there. Let's put it in a, a major triad. That's not really doing it much for me either. Um, let's take a piece of pipe. Well, that certainly didn't help anything. But music just appears to, uh, appeals to our innermost core. And you've all had a long day. And I want you to just take a couple of deep breaths and just enjoy what music can do um, for, for your soul. So just listen to this little piece. One of the wonderful things about music is every person in this room would have picked a different clip right there. But you're stuck with what I picked. But different pieces of music just do different things to us. So we'll start off by looking at just the, what I'm going to call the lifetime of a note. And what music really is, is we create notes with one of these or however. Um, we have a medium that gets the note from the instrument to the listener. We'll call it the transmission medium. And then we have consumption, which is you know somebody's hopefully going to be digging on it. So let me give you some examples of that. Uh, how do we create music, a musical instrument? Um, you may just be listening to music. You may be listening to the birds outside. Um, it may come out of a speaker. How do, we, how do we get music from one place to another? Well, we can do things like have tone control circuits. We can have graphic equalizers. But more important for this venue, uh, we're going to have um, performance venues. And we're going to talk about performance venues. We consume music, maybe with earbuds. And your psychoacoustical system is a big part um, of consuming music. So this is kind of an engineering chart, right? So now let's look at how we describe creation of music. And 
we're going to keep it simple and we're going to talk about the sound pressure waves that go into our ears. And what you can see here is I've drawn a little waveform in what we call the time domain. And you're also going to see in this lecture that we can describe notes in the frequency domain, where instead of looking at how a note evolves with time, we're going to look at what it's composed of um, in frequency. How do we characterize a transmission medium for sound? Well, the most typical thing that you've seen is with frequency response. So I've got a little frequency response here curve that shows at this frequency it does not pass uh, sounds as loudly as it does at this frequency. And then finally, consumption. Um, how do you describe consumption of music? This is the best I could come up with. So let's start by looking at the anatomy of a note. So this is a real simple example of a note. And what you can see is it has three big phases. It has an attack phase. And then it has a phase where we sustain the note. And then there's a decay. And this is a very simplified model. I, I know who the musicians are now because you're kind of going, yeah, right. But really, kind of that's what it boils down to. Um, attack, sustain, decay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull a couple of these wiggles in the sustain part out. And in this case, they're a sine wave. Um, and we call this a sinusoidal signal, but it's also a periodic signal. And what that means is that the time between repetitions of this signal it's called the period of the wave, and we call it T. So for a lot of the signals that we're going to look at in this presentation, they're going to be periodic signals. And what the engineers know is that if we know everything about one period of the signal, we know about the whole signal. So the frequency of the signal is 1 divided by the period. So for example, if this period was 0.0227 seconds, the frequency would be your orchestral tuning note of 440 hertz. So this is the time domain. And this is the most intuitive way of looking at sounds. Now we're going to look at sound pressure a different way. We're going to look at sounds versus frequencies. and so. In this plot, what you can see is that instead of having time on this axis, I have frequency, because we're going to look at the composition of the note. And in this case, I've got this beautiful 440 hertz sine wave. And shown on this plot, we have 440 hertz. And this is how strong it is. So see that? It's just a way of describing a note or a way of describing a sine wave. And you might say, well, that's not very interesting, but it is. Because what happens is if the note is not a pure sine wave, see how here I put some little boinky winkies and flatties on here? When I do that, now I start getting what we call harmonics of the signal. And now things are getting interesting. So my pure sine wave, which would be like the sound that you would get uh, from a flute, has just one component. But when I distort a signal, I build this harmonic series. And for the engineers, you go, ooh, that's a Fourier series. Yep, you got it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to dissect a note. I love uh, starting this slide with this picture because these are three of my absolute favorite people uh, in the world to play music with. And I just I love this picture. So this is Dylan. And what I asked Dylan to do was get out his berry sax and blow me a little something and then hold a note at the end because I want to dissect that note. And it's going to be kind of over here. So let's listen to what Dylan decided to uh, play.
So there's Dylan's solo. And what we're going to do is I extracted one period out of his wave. See how, actually, I should stay here, shouldn't I? See how I pulled just this tiny little bit out. And if I expand this, I see a whole bunch of waves that look like this. So this is one period of his wave. So now I'm going to do what is called Fourier analysis. And Fourier was a real smart guy, and he lived a long time ago. And what he gave us was the ability to go between the time domain, like you're seeing here, and the frequency domain, like you saw on the last slide. So let's look at Dylan's sound uh, in the frequency domain. So here's his sound in the time domain. And these are the harmonics of Dylan's signal, his sound. So his, that low D2 that he played, um, here is his fundamental. This is 73 hertz. But what's really cool is this is 146 hertz. This is 73 hertz more. This is. And it shows that that's, that sound that Dylan made is an extremely complicated sound. And a saxophone, that's one of the reasons it's such a wonderful instrument, because it has a really complex sound. Um, and to give you a little perspective, here's a piano keyboard. And the note Dylan played was this low D2. This frequency up here is the 35th harmonic. It's all the way up here. And look, he's still got a lot of energy. All the way up here at the upper end of the piano keyboard. That, this note up here, by the way, is about the upper level of a, the upper range of a soprano's voice. But it's, it's coming out of that baritone sax. So I want to digress a little bit here. And here's Dylan's sound. Here's one period of his sound. And we just looked at his sound in the frequency domain. Um, I can't hear enough of it. That's that beautiful D2. Let's compare it to the note of a trombone. And here is one period of a trombone signal. And what you can see, it's not nearly, it doesn't have all those wiggles, all those high frequencies wiggles that the baritone sax has. And so it kind of makes sense. It doesn't have nearly as much harmonic content. So let's listen to the trombone, and it'll be a couple octaves up. <laughs> So people often compare the trombone to the human voice. They say it's the closest instrument we have to, uh, to the human voice. But sax players, they, their phones ring a lot more than ours do. So what we're going to do now is we're going to change the harmonic content of Dylan's notes. So I'm going to take that note, and I'm going to put things in. I'm going to take things out. And then I'm going to show you a really fascinating result that comes from that. So here's his note with the full harmonic content. Can't hear enough of that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the high frequencies out of his note. So I'm just going to take them off. And so you can see here that I'm removing everything above 2,500 hertz. Let's see how that sounds. no real complaints there, right? Now I'm going to do something really cool. I'm going to pull the lower end out of Dylan's note. So I'm going to pull out all the frequencies below 400 hertz. You might say, how can you do that? His note was at 73 hertz. 
His note, the pitch of his note, that D2, is down here. And I'm absolutely removing it. And just for effect, I'm going to remove a few more harmonics of his tone. And let's hear how that sounds. First, we'll listen to this. Got the pitch. Now let's listen here. Doesn't sound great, but you know what note he's playing, right? Why is that so important? Here's why. Because when we were kids, we listened to Doc from the Tower of Power on that Barry Sachs over crappy little transistor radios like this. This transistor radio, that little speaker could never do 73 hertz. Won't happen. It won't pass anything below about 300 hertz. But we were digging on Doc, listening on, on these things. Um, here's an example, same note Dylan's playing. <laughs> So we hear the pitch, but the fundamental of the note is not there. OK, so a good way to con conclude this section is with the electric guitar, which I believe is probably one of the most versatile instruments out there. And now you've got the background to understand why. So when you pluck a guitar string, you're going to get really just a single vibration, right? You're going to get just the fundamental. That's not completely true. You're going to get some harmonics, but very little. But the guitar player with the guitar with an amplifier, here's what you can do. You can take that nice yah out of the guitar, and you can turn up the drive and it's going to make this amplifier distort. And when this amplifier distorts, it builds more harmonics. See that? So when I turn that drive up, I'm getting all these harmonics. Now, what the guitar player can do is shape those harmonics. See, they're all here now. The guitar player can use their tone knob or tone pedal or whatever, and they can shape them. They can get maybe a fat sound, or they can get a fuzzy sound. If you're playing jazz, you turn the drive way down so you get a nice clean note, and you turn the volume up. If you're Ozzy Osbourne, you turn the drive way up, and you turn the volume way down. Otherwise, you have the same kind of hearing Ozzy Osbourne has. So, the guitar, the electric guitar, one of the reasons it's so prevalent is you can do almost anything with it. OK. So now we're going to talk about intervals and scales. And at the end of this section, I'm going to show you how to tune a piano the way an old piano tuner does, by counting beats. And you're going to understand why that, why that um, happens. So I'm going to start off with an interval called a fifth. And it's a really unique uh, interval because the frequency ratio is 3 halves. Or in other words, you can see here that note 2 is 3 halves the frequency of note 1, right? It's 1 and a half times. Um, and if these two notes are distorted, I'm showing them as two sine waves. But if I distort them, a really neat thing happens. And that is that all the harmonics line up. So here we go. Here's note one. Its second harmonic is here. Its third harmonic is here. And remember, I got those harmonics because I distorted the note. Now let's take note two. Here's note two. Its second harmonic is here. See how the harmonics line up? So what that means is you can distort those notes all you want, and the harmonics will line up, and so it will still sound good. So if there are any RF engineers here, they're going to say, yeah, but you didn't cover the mixing terms. And you're right. I'm keeping it simple. But 
for you RF engineers, all the mixing terms line up. That's why you guys call a fifth the power cord. Um, simple examples. Turn it up all you want. It'll still sound good. Okay. So now, yeah. Uh, we on Zoom. We can't hear the sounds that you're playing. Is there anybody you could click a uh, share computer sound? Oh yeah, yeah. I thought we had. I thought we had that set. I am sorry. I'm glad you caught me on that. Yeah, no problem. Let's see. Let's see. Let me try it again, okay? Sounds good. I'll let you know if it helps through. Yeah, please, please do. How'd we do? Perfect. Ah, thank you so much for catching that up front. I really appreciate it. Okay. So we looked at this interval we call a fifth, but who made up all these notes? Whose idea was this? And so we're going to go back to the Greeks, to Pythagoras. And the Greeks loved integer relationships. They're all over their architecture. They're all over their music. They're everywhere. And some smart Greek guy, I think it was Pythagorean, Pythagoras, because he got his name on it. But he said, you know, if we just go up a fifth, and then we go up another fifth. Oh, and let's drop the octave. Let's go up another fifth and another fifth. All of a sudden, if you do that a bunch of times, you're going to get up to a note that was the octave of where you started. And let's look at the math. It's really easy. I'm going to start at a note that's frequency, I'll call it k, because I'm going to have frequency 1, frequency 2, and stuff. I start at frequency k, multiply by 3 halves, and I get frequency k plus 1. OK, so I get the fifth. Now, let's look at going up two fifth intervals. Here's frequency fk. I'm going to multiply it by 3 halves twice, and I'm going to get fk plus 2. Now, there are all kinds of ways that people describe why the Pythagorean scale doesn't work right, and we need tempered scales. But lots of engineers here, so I'm going to show it the simplest way I can. And I'm going to say, here we went up 1, here we went up 2. Let's go up 12. And we go, oh, nuts. This is not um, a power of 2. So I went up the circle of fifths, like all the musicians in here practice with. And then I ended up with something that sounded like an octave, but it wasn't tuned very well. So a piano that is tuned with Pythagorean tuning, it sounds good in only one key. You play it in another key, it doesn't sound right. So this was a problem. And so this is where the engineers came in. And the engineers said, hey, we can get pretty close to Pythagorean tuning by using constant logarithmic spacing. And all those notes on the piano keyboard, there's the formula for your frequency. Let's make it a little clear. Here's key 0. So its frequency is f0 is 27.5 times 2 to the 0. 2 to the 0 is 1. It's 27.5 hertz. Up here, key number 87. Don't, don't give me a bad time, because it's not an 88 key keyboard. I'm counting like a programmer. This was key 0. This is key 87. So I, I, got, I got all 88, Julio. So this is your basic formula. So it uses constant logarithmic spacing. And let's listen to this clip of some people that might really appreciate um, being able to play in different keys.
one of my favorite key, uh, key changes. In fact, you can see the goosebumps with that one. <laughs> OK, so just as a quick example, um, a perfect fifth, your interval is 1.5. Your tempered fifth is 1.4983. They're pretty darn close, but they are not spot on. So in the 1700s, this was not an easy sell. So Bach wrote this book of piano pieces called The Well-Tempered Clavier. Clavier's piano in German, I think. And he wrote a piece in every single key and said, take that, see how that sounds. And it sounded great. So the upside is now you can play in any key you want, and it'll sound pretty good. The downside is that the harmonics don't line up perfectly, and we can hear beats. Now, you'll see what those are in a second. But in reality, a good singer or any good instrumentalist, if they know they really have to tune to another instrumentalist, they are going to go to Pythagorean tuning because they don't want anybody to hear beats. And here's an example of the tempered scale. And Julie Andrews was, is just a masterful singer. And for this slide, what we're going to do is she's going to sing these words, and then she's going to hold a note. She's just going to hold one note. And the chord that the orchestra playing is going to change underneath her. So she's going to hold the note, and her note is going to end up in different places in the chord. Some of you will hear her adjust her intonation. Most of us won't. But let's listen to the clip. Here we go. Here's the fun. So she was on the root of the chord. She was on the fifth of the chord. She was on the seventh of the chord. She was on the ninth of the chord. And it sounded beautiful, in my opinion. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about beats. And the reason I'm going to do this is because I'm going to show you how to tune a piano in a bit. And when notes are far apart, we hear them as two different notes. Um, or. So listen to these. These are two notes for you musicians a whole step apart. Whoops. So you can really tell that there are multiple notes being played. The fact that you hear one way up above, we're just not going to talk about that for now. But when we play notes that are very, very, very close together, our brain processes them differently. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play two tones, and one is going to be C down 3 hertz, and one is going to be a C that is up 3 hertz. And I want you to listen for the beats. Hear those? That's what your piano tuner is listening for. Um, and for you engineers, this makes perfect sense because of this simple trigonometric identity. I'm adding two notes, and I get what we call the carrier, which is basically going to be that C. And then I'm going to get this modulating signal. And this is what the sound looks like in the time domain. And we can hear that. So those are the beats that. Um, 
a piano tuner is listening to. And let's see how we tune a piano. And I'm way going to oversimplify this, so I hope there's nobody out in Zoom land or here that actually knows how to tune a piano. Because it's not a matter of disrespect, it's a matter of trying to keep moving here. But the idea is the piano tuner pulls out a tuning fork and they get their C, their middle C. Most do it with a, a, an A, but don't worry about that. So they get one note right. Then what they do is they tune all the intervals in that first octave, the fifth being just one of them. And then from there, they tune the rest of the piano in octaves. So let's look at how they tune a tempered fifth. So the piano, where'd my other note go? Ah, here we go. So here's our C. Here's our G, it's fourth up. And so he's going to hit those notes hard enough that he, there's going to be some harmonics. So let's look at them. The C, the one, two, third harmonic of the C is going to line up with the second harmonic of the G, and they're going to be nine tenths of a hertz apart with tempered tuning. So see that? They're not going to land right on each other. They're going to be just slightly apart. And we're going to hear beats just like we heard in the last slide. So you're going to hear beats at about one per second. So let's listen. So the piano tuner is counting those, and he's moving that G until the they hear um, about one beat per second. So it's really hard to hear. I accentuated this clip so mortals like me could actually uh, hear it. So other intervals. We talked about the perfect fifth, but there are all kinds of beautiful intervals, and I just want to give you an example of some of them. I could listen to that one all day. But what were, you were hearing were just different intervals with this absolutely beautiful uh, melody. OK. So now let's look at how music gets from the musician to the audience. And I like to think of a musical venue as just another musical instrument. And you'll see that different kinds of music work best in different uh, venues. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we listen to music in a really nice environment like this. Sometimes we're at a dive bar club with cinder block walls, and we're loving the vibe. That's as good as a venue as you're going to get. Sometimes your venue is your car. Um, CDs are sometimes produced for optimal acoustics in your car. Um, if you listen on earbuds, you got to trust the producer of the song, because there's no venue. You're getting the venue they gave you. So for our discussion, we're going to focus on the frequency response of the room. And for you engineers, all the analysis and the techniques we're going to show they are the exact same thing that the Wi-Fi router in this room is using. All the math is exactly the same for a radio signal, the radar signal, an acoustic signal, and underwater. It's all the same. So if you're in a venue like this, here's the stage. The person up here has a little bit different frequency response than the person here. Every seat's different. So I want to show you how we measure frequency response. The simplest way to do it, the most intuitive way, would be play a sine wave at one frequency, 
see how loud it is. Play it at another frequency, see how loud that is. Play it, at, and eventually you get all the frequencies and you get a frequency response plot. But that only tells half the story because you get the frequency, the absolute value of the frequency response, but you don't get what we call the phase. So you're only getting half the story. So here's how we actually characterize rooms. Um, what we're going to do is I, I have a simple room here, and I'm only looking at four reverberant, four paths. I'm just doing four to keep it simple. So what we're going to do is make a very loud um, sound at the stage. Um, a hand clap could work well. A chair falling over is fine. If you're a mathematician, you call it an impulse. But a hand clap works just fine for me. And so what I've done is for every path from the stage to the listener, I have an amplitude. Because remember, when it hits the walls, you're going to lose a little bit of sound, right? I have an amplitude and then a delay. So I'm going to drop that chair here, and here's what the listener is going to hear, somewhat exaggerated. I'm going to go, and the chair is going to fall. It's here, you could hear. Hear them? You could hear the re reflections. But what that person is going to hear is they're going to hear whack coming from A1, because it's the direct path. Then they're going to hear whack coming from A2, and then they're going to hear. So this is what we call the impulse response of the room. And what we're going to do is we're going to use one of Fourier's buddies' techniques, and we're going to use Laplace analysis. And that is going to give us the frequency response of this room. And this plot is, is accurate for this model. So it's not a flat frequency response. This room, same thing. It's not going to be a flat response. Now, sometimes you'll be playing a gig, and somebody in the audience will say, man, you know, your singer is so good, but when she went to really hit her money note in that song, man, it just fell flat for me. And I'm going to say, the money note was this frequency. Get a better seat. It wasn't her fault. The room cut her out. So as I said in the Crocodile Jones movie, um, um, that wasn't a performance venue. This is a performance venue. So this is a beautiful 14th century uh, church. And here's the impulse response of that church from the apps back to some place in the church. Let's just listen to it. You already know what it sounds like. Think of it in your head. You tip over a chair in a big room. Just think of it. Here it is. That's what that room sounds like. Kind of what you'd expect it to sound like, right? It actually takes eight seconds for that sound to go down what we call 60 dB. It's a very reverberant um, room. So in our first example, we looked at just four paths, but now we're going to do all the paths because of the analysis we're going to use. And of course, I'm going to let MATLAB do the work. I'm not going to do that one by hand. Um, and this is the frequency response of that cathedral. This is 10 kilohertz here. So it's a beautiful, complex frequency response with no big suckouts in it. So now what I'm going to show you, because we're going to come back to that, but I want to show you how you can put a sound in any room you want. Or in other words, I can take your sound. You can blow your horn a little bit, or like that take I had from Dylan. I can put him in any room I want if I know the impulse response of that room. And here's how we do it. And here's the sound. And if this looks kind of like the last slide or the inverse of it, you're right. And I'm not going to go into the math here, but if you're an engineer, we call this a finite impulse response digital filter. But for everyone else, just this is, these are the mechanics of how we put sounds 
um, in different, different rooms. So what I want to do now is I want to have a little bit of fun with York Minster, that great big church. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take some music that was made to be played in a venue like that, and I'm going to put it in York Minster. And of course, they added echo in the recording that I started with, but I'm going to put in a lot more echo, and you're going to see that it doesn't really trash the sound that badly. Here's the recording. Now let's put it in York Minster with that mathematical model I just showed. Okay, so it's a little exaggerated and it's a bit of a mess. But one of the beautiful things about those old cathedrals is Gabrielli and Monteverdi and those guys, they're pretty smart. What they did is they would actually put one brass choir on one side of the church and another set of brass instruments on another side. And depending where you were in the church, you heard different things. For you musicians, I might have a major chord, and then the next big note from the soloist is the seventh of the chord I just played. Well, if the chord got echoed, the chord just turned into a seventh chord because of the echoes. The seventh in the actual music was over here, but because of the reverberation, it got squashed into this, and you're hearing a different piece of music. And that's why they'd put the brass choirs on different sides of the room. Here's another example. This is an example of just a pure, what we call dry recording with no echo, and then we're going to put it in York Minster. So here's the dry recording. <laughs> And now let's put it in York Minster. You may have heard some overlapping notes changing chords there, because they were. OK, and now what we're going to do is we're going to put Louis Armstrong in York Minster and see how he does. So here's Louis. Okay, now let's put Louis in York Minster. Oh, I can't I can't do that to Louis Armstrong. <laughs> but I'm gonna digress a little bit to music and musical styles and architecture. And people do theses on this stuff, but would everyone would have loved Louis Armstrong if he played this in the 1500s or 1600s? Probably not. So did music evolve with architecture and electronic reproduction? Real deep subject. But I believe it did. I'm sure Louis would believe the same thing. So what I want to show you now is what goes on in a recording studio. Because we said we can take sounds and we can put them anywhere we want. And that gives the producer tremendous latitude in what they do. So I just want to show you how they do it. So they start off by putting the performer in a soundproof dead studio, not one single reflection. And then they stick some earphones on them. And the sound from the performer is going to come out here, the microphone, and then it's going to get captured as what we call a dry recording. There's no reverb. There's no echo on that recording. But if you, if you want the performer to think they're playing well and be happy, you got to give them something. And so what the studio does is they add a little bit of reverb to your sound, and they play it in your headphones. And now you go, oh, man, I sound pretty good here. Um, 
And then they give you what we call a scratch track. Um, the songwriter will often have these tracks that are just synthesized or whatever. And they're playing that so the performer knows when they're speeding up or slowing down or whatever. For you musicians, I'm not going to go into the idea of a studio with a bunch of glass rooms. We're, we're not going there. We're keeping it simple. So the performer thought he played this great performance, but the producer got what they wanted, which is that dry track. And they're going to mix that with tracks from other performers, and they're going to make the CD. So, I'll give you an example, and let's start off with the dry track. I mean, usually as you have to, right? But let's see what the studio turns that into. So that's kind of how a recording studio works. Other ways you can do it, like at Studio West, they have a bunch of glass rooms so you can see all your buddies. But when you play bad notes, they get a dry recording and they can fix it. When I'm playing those notes, they're doing a lot of fixing, I can tell you that. So I want to move now to this mixing board. And this is primarily for the engineers. but. When you go to any music venue, you're going to see the soundboard with all those lights and things like that. Let's learn what it does. So the idea is that everybody on stage has a microphone. And we've got, this is why there's so many knobs on a soundboard. And you've got an adjustment. So the singer gets fed to the horns monitor. The singer gets fed to the drummer's monitor. The singer gets fed to her monitor or his monitor. And then, of course, all they get sent to the audience. And so if you go to a venue before the show starts, they do a sound check. And what they do is they'll, they'll tell the horn player, hey, just play, play a little bit. So the horn player starts playing. And then the other people on the stage say, give me more of the horn player or give me less. See that? Then they go to the next musician. And they do the same thing. And that's what a sound check is. Um, for me, I like a lot of drummer, because I want to hear that ride cymbal. Plus, I love the drummer I usually play with. Uh, but when I hear that ride signal, I know exactly where, where we are. Now, the sound engineer doesn't do the sound check once. Why? Because the venue changes all night. When they do the sound check, there's nobody there. But the room fills up with people. And then they want the music louder so people can dance. So the sound engineer is working and making adjustments. If you look at the musicians, they'll sometimes go, because they're hearing too much of something. If the musicians aren't comfortable, you're not going to get a good product. So if you go to a venue, you like what you hear, the person running the soundboard definitely deserves some of the credit. Um, this picture was just actually taken Sunday night. I'm not saying the Kraken has a bad stage or anything like that. But if you're on a bad stage, you're going to hear mush. And the band is totally going to lose its groove. So how do you get the groove back? You put in a pure tone. My two claves, you can see they have slightly different frequencies. But that's going to cut through whatever is going on. And especially if the drummer goes straight into instead of grooving, everybody's going to pay attention and say, ooh. And she pulls everybody back in. Um, so sometimes it can get pretty mushy uh, in a place like this. 
Okay. So moving along, now I'd like to explain some of the signal processing that occurs in voices and brass instruments, and they're really similar. So whether it's done in the vocal tract or in a horn, in a circuit, in a computer, all the math is the same. Now, if you're a vocalist, I'm going to oversimplify um, on you here because I want to keep things simple and I want to keep to the, uh, the core concepts here. Something that might surprise you, especially the musicians, is the people that know the most about this stuff are the people that do voice compression and vocoder work, uh, voice compressors and uh, automatic speech recognition. They have moved the bar in music so far over the last 20 years. So we'll start off by talking about the excitation for either the voice or a brass instrument. Um, for a brass instrument, we go like this. And for a voice, you've got these vocal cords, or I think they like to call them vocal cords, and they go blah, 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 blah. But they don't make a sine wave. They make a signal that is rich in harmonic content. This is just an idea of what um, these puffs of air coming from your lips or from um, your vocal cords might look like. But when we put them in the frequency domain, here's our period, here's our fundamental, and here are all these wonderful harmonics. So whether it's a voice or a brass instrument, this slide is completely appropriate because it's showing the harmonic series that's being either played into your vocal tract or being blown into your horn. So now let's look at what singers do. And the excitation signal is sent to a resonant cavity that has the ability to change its characteristics with time. That's a mouthful. But here's the idea. A singer can change the frequency response of their voice box, of their vocal tract. It's called a singer's format. And in this case, here's a, one of a bass voice singing B flat two, way down here, down near where Dylan's note was, and then putting these resonances in. And as humans, our vocal tract is what makes our voice our voice. That's what makes us recognize. That's why we don't sound uh, all the same. Why is that practical? Because a soprano especially, how could a soprano sing all night over a whole orchestra without falling apart? How could she do that? Here's how she does it. She uses the formats in her vocal tract. And so for every excitation, this is the note that Sarah Brightman is going to sing in this clip. And here are the harmonics. And this is what she can do with her vocal tract. She can build what the engineers will call a bandpass filter around every frequency. So let's hear her do it. So she could sing over the whole orchestra. Pavarotti can do the same, could uh, do the same thing. So now what I want to do is talk a little more about horns. And I'm going to start off with a piece of PVC pipe that's closed at both ends. And you're going to say, well, um, well we're going to look at why this why that sounds different than this. What makes a horn sound different than a pipe? Well, we'll start with our piece of PVC pipe and we'll quickly end up at the horn. So these are little puffs of air. And they're coming, they are our excitation signal from the, from the lips. And if this puff of air goes down here, 
turns around, comes back, and I do another puff right when it reflects again. Can you see how the pipe would be what's called resonant? Going puff, boing, puff, boing. I could have multiple puffs of air in the pipe, but as long as one comes back and hits when I puff again, then the pipe is, I'm still going to get that effect. So what that means is that a pipe has multiple resonant frequencies because there are more puffs of air inside. Now, as a quick aside, this is how exa tuned exhaust systems work on motorcycles and cars. Precisely um, the same um, effect. So here is the equation that describes all the resonant modes of a pipe that is closed at both ends. So, whoops. And what's cool about the pipe at cl that's closed at both ends, because obviously we're getting toward a problem here, aren't we? But what's good about it is that it, it resonates at the fundamental frequency, the second harmonic, the third harmonic, the fourth harmonic, etc. If the pipe was open at one end, it wouldn't do that. It would resonate. If I try to go between there, pipes in no way. But if uh, somebody on Zoom, can you mute yourself, please? That pipe was bad enough. Um, so, okay, so, he, and here's a quick example of the pipe. If I go, hear it changing, <laughs> right, hear it changing. And I had actually slides for both configurations, but I wanted to shorten things. Okay, so now let's look at the excitation frequency of our pipe that's closed at both ends. Excitation and resonant frequency. And we go, hey, this really works. At every frequency, this thing is going to resonate. Well, that's important because with a mouthpiece, you can only blow about two and a half octaves. And so if the pipe is an octave and a fifth before it resonates, that's a problem. But if it resonates at all these, you get So it's a much more musical, uh, useful musical instrument. But there's this basic problem of how do you blow it if it's closed at both ends? How do you do that? And this is where we look at the bell of the horn. And let's see, let me move up here. So this bell has what we call a Bessel flare, named after a famous uh, mathematician. If you're an engineer, we're going to call it an impedance matching device, just like an antenna on a radio. But what it does is it allows this horn to have an open end so some sound can leak out, but acoustically, it's a closed pipe. So it's closed on this end. It's closed on this end. You hear what leaks out. But all the acoustical properties are a pipe closed at both ends. Thank you. Everybody awake now? And so if I go like this, this is about 49 inches. See what it sounds like. So. But it doesn't sound very good, doesn't it? It doesn't sound like a trombone. Sounds like somebody's blowing a pipe, doesn't it? So something is clearly missing. 
We solve the acoustical problem, so now we have something that will resonate at a bunch of useful frequencies so we can get a lot of notes out of it, but it doesn't sound good. So we got to do one more thing, and here it is. It's the mouthpiece. So if you're a brass player, your mouthpiece is something that you're just always messing with. You're, you're going after that sound. You're trying, to, you're trying to get the absolute perfect mouthpiece. But for the engineers, we're going to say the mouthpiece is just an acoustic bandpass filter. Here's the idea. This is the frequency response of a pipe at all of its different harmonics. And you can see that it's really not all that interesting. But now let's look at the cavity of the mouthpiece. It's kind of got this little thing in here. And what's this thing going to be doing? It's just like a room or a performance venue. It's reflecting back. And it becomes what we call a bandpass filter. So if I take that pipe and I put a mouthpiece on it, instead of having this harmonic series that falls off, the harmonic series, it attenuates the basic fundamental note you're playing, but then it accentuates other, these higher um, frequencies. And that is what puts the sizzle in the sound. And let me just play you a, a clip of a bunch of trombones playing together. So that's the difference between having a mouthpiece and having a piece of pipe. So after all that talk about, um, about the mathematics and the physics of horns, let's, let's just listen to somebody who could really rip on a horn. And this first clip is going to show you how this performer, Maynard Ferguson, can do intonation, articulation, emotion. And as he's playing, if you were to ask him if he was still alive, he'd say the main thing I was doing was listening. Because at time, he's looking where he needs to tune with the other performers. Uh, you'll also see that we talked about discrete, what we call partials in the horn. He's playing so high that those partials are so close together that he can just fight the horn between them. So let's just listen to what this guy can do. Now, what I want to do now is I want to dissect that last note that he played. And that's what this picture is. So what you're going to hear, and I'll play this for you in a second, is you're going to hear Maynard ripping out this high note here. And then, of course, you're going to see a harmonic. But what are all these down here? This is the bass trombone. Remember, it's a much lower frequency, and it's full of harmonics. So these are going to be the harmonics of the G3 from the bass trombone. And this is going to be Maynard. And here's the little section that I took this clip from. Hear that? Hear the bass trombone? So that's doing it right. OK. So as I promised you guys, there's nothing particularly useful in this lecture. Uh, you didn't become a better engineer. None of you became better musicians. But what I hope I did is took you to this, this bridge between music and engineering and showed you a small part of you know, what I just find is a fascinating um, view. Uh, as you may have guessed, these are two subjects I love very much. The hardest part of preparing this was all the stuff that I had to, um, had to omit. 
But more importantly than anything else, um, being part of the musical community, the engineering community, and working with my students is a greater gift for, for me than anything uh, that you saw here. So before s signing off, if you're going to be taking part A in the spring, stick around. Let's talk about some musical projects. And, um, and yeah, we'll talk about acoustical senior design projects. And I want to thank everybody for coming today. Have a wonderful holiday. Mm -hmm.